And those principles of war have been applied for generations now in our, in our military, in our U.S. military. But they also apply in a spiritual sense, and I'm going to talk about them and tell you how I see them applying in a spiritual sense today. What is spiritual warfare, and what biblical weapons do we have at our disposal? Hi, and welcome to this episode of Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg a podcast of the Joshua Fund, a ministry dedicated to blessing Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. I'm Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund, and today we present General William Boykin's perspective on the reality of warfare as a people and nation and our spiritual responsibilities in this fight. General Boykin reveals how we're giving the enemy too much credit He outlines the weaknesses of our enemy and our duty as watchmen and the principles to counter the enemy and show our advantage over the enemy as individuals, churches, and our nation. Take a listen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. God bless you. It's great to be here. I'm uh, indeed very honored that uh, Joel has asked me to be with you today. And thank you, Joel, for this great honor. I was in uh, California not too long ago uh, down at uh, Shadow Mountain Church and a little old lady came up to me and she said every time I hear you speak you say something critical of the Marine Corps. (laughs) She said I was a Marine and I'm going to whip you if you keep doing that. (laughs) I said well that solves that. I'm not talking about the Marine Corps anymore. But I didn't say anything about the Navy. (laughs) So there was this Navy SEAL. Now you know They're not the brightest bulbs, but they are, in fact, some of the finest warriors we've got. But this Navy SEAL enlisted in the the, uh, Navy uh, service, and he was decided that he wanted to be an officer. So he took the officer candidate school test three times. (laughs) Failed it all three times. Well, and finally they liked him so much, they said, we're going to give you one more chance. You study all weekend, and we're going to give you the test next week. And if you don't pass this test, you don't have any chance. So he got all his buddies together and said, we've got to study through the weekend, because I've got to pass this test on Monday. Well, the uh, problem with that was they were all SEALs too. <laughs> so they studied all through the weekend. And they took him in there the to the commander's office on Monday morning, and the commander really wanted to make this guy an officer. So the commander looked at him and said, okay. He said, I'm going to give you a test, and it's going to consist of one question. And here it is. Spell Navy. (laughs) Oh, he started sweating bullets. Oh, he said, oh. In about that time, all his buddies came in. They sat down around him. They said, well, what, are you, what are you spelling? He said, Navy, Navy. So they were watching and they were sweating bullets too. <laughs> N-A-V-Y. And all his buddies said, oh, give him another chance. I want to welcome all of you here today that, uh, are, as Joel said, from all the countries that are, uh, that are uh, listening in today, and, uh, and I'm speaking to you as well as those people here in this beautiful city of Philadelphia. So uh, uh, thanks for all of you being here. Uh, Joel asked me to talk about warfare. Well, let me tell you, the warfare is raging. I, I saw several of you coming in this morning that said, oh, I saw on Fox News that you're in the news again. You're controversial again. Hey, it's warfare. I'm testifying in... Uh, Elena Kagan's uh, uh, hearing, and I guess a bunch of it, probably just about all of you saw on the news this morning that they're, they're just raising Cain now because this radical evangelical is going to be testifying at the confirmation hearing for Elena Kagan. And I must tell you, it's just more of the same. God bless you. And, uh, I'm, uh, in fact, I'm leaving here. Uh, I'll sign a few books right after I speak, and then I've got to go over and do Fox News at 12.15 a day with a a Pakistani that is uh, running the Islamic uh, studies program at American University. And I, I just tell you, I mean, it, warfare is real. And we need to understand that every time we come to an epicenter conference, we are in the worst spiritual warfare. The first one we did over in Jerusalem, I was just right up to the moment I stepped on stage. I had terrible bronchitis. Uh, Joel was sick. As a matter of fact, it was really funny. 
he would go out on stage, introduce a speaker, and then he would turn and he'd say, clear the hallways, I'm going to the bathroom. <laughs> I don't know if I'm supposed to tell that, am I? <laughs> At any rate, but he was sick and I was sick and we just, we, warfare is raging. Listen folks, we're in a battle every single day, whether you want to be or not. We're in a battle as a nation, we're in a battle as Christians. The Bible says that in the final days we're going to be taken before kings and rulers. We're going to be taken into the synagogues and we're going to be persecuted in His name. But it also says this is a time for you to be a witness for me. We are in a battle and we need to understand that. Exodus 15.3 says this, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is His name. Why did the Bible call the Lord a warrior? And I think it's very clearly because He's highlighting the fact that we're in a war. This Christian life that we live, we are in a war. And I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm going to tell you the punchline of my whole message today. It is time for you to get off the pews of the churches and to get into the battle because our future depends on it. You've got to take what you learn in those churches and you've got to get out in the world and you've got to become warriors. Second Corinthians talks in, in chapter 10 verses 3 and 4. It talks about how our weapons are not carnal, they're spiritual weapons and we're fighting against strongholds. And then in Ephesians 6, Paul, the, the, um, the great writer, uh, was telling us, using the metaphor of a Roman soldier, which undoubtedly as he wrote this, he was looking at a Roman soldier, where he talked about the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth, and the shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel, and taking up the sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith. It's about warfare. But so many people don't want to acknowledge that. So many people think that the enemy is created in Hollywood. Peter says that our enemy Satan walketh about like a roaring lion looking for whom he might devour. Satan is real. The enemy is real. And we as Christians have got to learn how to fight this enemy who has already been defeated. Amen. This enemy who has no power compared to the God that we serve. But we go in thinking that our adversary is, is, is so difficult. And remember when uh, Elisha said, open my servant's eyes, that he might see that the enemy, uh, that the army fighting for us is greater than the army fighting against us. And when they opened the eyes, what did they see? He saw chariots of fire on the hillside and realized that God's army was greater than Satan's army. Where's my water? It's starting again. Well, let me say a couple of things about the enemy, and then I'm going to talk to you about the principles of war. First of all, we give the enemy too much credit. Sometimes, you know, we blame Satan for things that are just life. Life happens. But everything that goes bad, we blame Satan. Well, the fact of the matter is, let's go back to the Bible. God's army is at least two-thirds larger than Satan's, right? Okay, keep that in mind. <clears throat> the second thing is, Satan is not able to read our mind. And the third thing is, he is not omnipresent. He can only be in one place at a time. His, he has demonic forces that can be in many places simultaneously, but he cannot be in more than one place at a time. Remember that. I'm going to talk to you today about the principles of war. A guy named Carl von Clausewitz, and by the way, let me say this to all of you. I'm talking about warfare at the individual level, but I'm also talking about warfare collectively. As we uh, think about the churches that are listening in today, as well as the individuals, I'm talking about collective warfare. I'm talking about churches, ministries, other things, other entities that are involved in the war that we're involved in today, that are involved in the battle that is raging today. And I'll talk about it from a military perspective. The principles of war. A guy named Karl von Clausewitz, who was actually a Prussian, and he was uh, hired to train a young Prussian prince and train him in warfare. And when von Clausewitz left, he wrote a, a treatise that he actually left for the young prince and ultimately that treatise became a book called On War. I've never known a military officer that didn't have a copy of On War, in which he outlines the principles of warfare. The U.S. military today has nine principles of war, 
And those principles of war have been applied for generations now in our, in our military, in our U.S. military. But they also apply in a spiritual sense, and I'm going to talk about them and tell you how I see them applying in a spiritual sense today. Our verse of the day today is found in Exodus chapter 15, verse 3. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Our prayer requests today are, number one, pray that more people will be given to prayer and intercession and are willing to stand for the epicenter, the Middle East and churches around the world. And secondly, pray for leaders of churches and leaders of nations that God protects them from the onslaught of the devil. Von Clausewitz's first principle of war is objective. Objective. What is your objective? What's the objective of your ministry or the ministry that you're involved in? What is the objective? Is the objective blessing Israel as it is in the case of the Joshua Fund? Is that the objective? What has God called you to do? When we think back to Operation Desert Storm, let me give you a practical example. Operation Desert Storm. We went into Kuwait in late February of 1991. We had a UN mandate to kick Saddam Hussein and his forces out of Kuwait and run them back into Iraq. When we got there, we did just that. And few of you can forget the scene of the highway of death with all the thousands of vehicles that were destroyed up and down that highway going all the way back to the Iraq border. Just thought they'd been killed by tanks and aircraft overhead and artillery and so forth. And then many people began to criticize George W. Bush and saying, why didn't you go all the way to Baghdad? Why didn't you go in there and take care of Saddam Hussein? Why didn't you just go destroy him? And the reality was that was not the objective. We were operating under a United Nations mandate. We had a coalition force together there that included Muslim nations. And had we crossed that border and gone to Baghdad to go after Saddam Hussein, those Muslims that were part of that coalition would have said, that proves it. We see what your intentions were all along. It was to occupy Iraq and control the oil fields there. George W. Bush knew what the objective was. The objective was to take, to to run the forces of Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. And he stayed focused on that objective. When we look at this in the context of spiritual warfare, you've got to stay focused on your objective. What is the objective of your ministry? What has God called you to do? And the first thing there is you've got to know what God has called you to do. What is God's calling on your life? What is God's calling on your ministry? You've got to seek God to understand what that calling is. You know, Joel Rosenberg is is a guy that understands the objective of his ministry. People are constantly trying to get him to get involved in other things. But he stays focused on the objective of the Joshua Fund. Right, Joel? He knows exactly what his objective is. He knows what God has called him to do, and he stays focused on that objective. And nothing will deter him from it. See, one of the problems is if you're a hard worker, if you're a spiritual person, the people around you are going to try to draw you into doing other things. It's just the way it is. Pastor, your pastor is going to try to get you involved in doing other things because you're so good at what you're doing. The question you have to ask yourself, is that what God's called me to do? Is that what God has called our ministry to do? Is that the direction that God wants us to do? Because see what happens is the enemy will give you opportunities to serve God that would really deny you from doing God's will. Does that make sense to you? He will draw you into other things that look so appealing that are actually within God's kingdom. But it's distracting you from the main objective, which is what God's called you to do. And you'll get so bogged down trying to do everything that people want you to do. And I'm the world's worst about this. By the way, I'm talking to myself this morning. You hear me, Jerry? Yes, sir, I do. (laughs) This is what happens in the Christian world. And we have to be very careful of that. So stay focused on the objective. What is the objective of your ministry? And don't let things distract you or divert you. The second principle of war is offensive. Now, some people find me offensive. (laughs) You know, the media primarily, especially the the left-leaning media. But having said that, you do not win on the defensive. 
You have to go on the offense. Amen. Think about it. June 6, 1944, when we launched the invasion of Western Europe to go in and relieve the beleaguered cities of France and, and the Benelux countries there, that was going on the offensive. Dwight Eisenhower and the coalition forces there were going on the offensive. They were taking the war to the Germans. And their intention was to defeat and drive the Germans out and drive them back to Germany. And uh, that was the day we went on the offensive. In a spiritual context, we absolutely must take the offensive. Now, what does that mean in a spiritual context? <clears throat> First of all, it means you have to anticipate what your enemy can do. You have to have some sense of what the enemy could do against you, to you, to stop you, to distract you, to uh, damage your ability to do what God has called you to do. And then you have to start praying out ahead of it. You see, I think the most fundamental weapon we have in spiritual warfare is prayer and intercession. I said prayer and intercession, and I believe there is a difference. Now, I am not a theologian, and I would tell you that uh, Pastor Joe and, and Pastor Greg Laurie and all them, they'll get me aside back here when I get through here, and they'll sort me out on my theology, because I'm not a theologian. But this much I do, I understand warfare. And I believe there is a difference between prayer and intercession. When you say, I'm going to intercede for you, that means I'm going to get between you and the enemy. Now, intercessors, if you look at them, they're pretty beat up, because that's what God's called them to do. And intercessors are beat up because they're taking hits for you. They're taking hits for whatever it is they're interceding for. We can all pray, but, all, uh, but everybody is not willing to intercede. I had a girl one time call me and said, my, my boyfriend's going to Iraq. She said, what can I do? And I said, well, you can pray for him or you can intercede for him. She said, tell me the difference. I said, if you pray for him, God's going to bless you. God's going to answer your prayers. But if you intercede for him, what that technically means is, you're standing between him and the enemy. She wrote me an email back and said, I think I'll pray for him. <laughs> okay, that's your choice. Prayer and intercession. Look, to go on the offensive, we've got to get out ahead of things. Look, I start praying. I mean, I've learned something after getting sick. Every time I come to an epicenter conference, I've learned to start praying months ahead, saying, God, give me health. God, make me strong. God, I, I ask you to prevent any sickness from falling upon me. We've got to start getting out ahead of things and praying and interceding for things that we know could be devastating attacks by the enemy. But normally what happens is we're on the defensive. What we'd rather do is wait for the enemy to attack and then start binding it and rebuking it. You can tell I grew up in the South. <laughs> Look, get ahead of it. Pray ahead of it. That's taking the offensive. Don't wait. Listen carefully. Don't wait for God to give you opportunities to spread the gospel. This is going on the offensive. Find those enclaves, those strongholds in your community and take the gospel to them. You may have a Muslim community around. You may have a Muslim stronghold there that, where there are people that need to hear the gospel. You know, Muslims are spiritual people. They're very spiritual people. Just like when, uh, when the young boy was sitting out watching, you know, praying and waiting to die. And Ishmael's mother was sitting there watching him, and arrows flying away, waiting for him to die. And the angel came and said, I've heard the child's cry. Same thing is happening in the Muslim world today. They're crying out to God. They want to hear God. And what we need to do is take the gospel to them so that indeed they can hear God. And when that light comes, they're coming to faith in record numbers. And I think Pastor Shariot is going to talk to you this afternoon about just that. That's taking the offensive. Get on the offensive. Tear down those strongholds. Take the gospel and start bringing down those. Get involved in something. Get involved in the Joshua Fund. I'm on the board of a ministry that uh, takes people into Israel and, and walks the land with them and, and asks them to pray over this land. It's called Faith Walk International. And get involved in something. And that's, that's a way that you get on the offensive. But it's very important that you get on the offensive and not just sit back and wait for the enemy to attack and then respond and react. Get out ahead of it. The third principle of war is mass. Mass is a matter of assembling your combat power at the right place and time to strike a lethal blow to your enemy. 
June 4th, 1942, the Japanese controlled all of the Pacific. The Japanese Navy did. We had just suffered six months earlier a devastating blow at Pearl Harbor. The Japanese were still controlling all of the Southern Pacific, Central Pacific. Admiral Chester Nimitz knew that he had to, he had to defeat the Japanese Navy in order for us to have any chance at all to win in the Pacific. On the 4th of June, 1942, he massed all of his aircraft carriers off an island called Midway. And there he defeated the Japanese Navy, destroying four of their carriers. And from that point on, the Japanese Navy was no longer in charge of the Pacific because he massed his forces to strike a lethal blow and that turned the tide of World War II in the Pacific. There are times when in your ministry, in your church, in your ministry, in your personal life, you've got to mass your forces to strike a lethal blow to the enemy. You know, there's a guy, and uh, Pastor Joe knows him very well, and he's quite well known in the Calvary Chapel movement. There's a guy up in Maine named Ken Graves. This is the meanest preacher I've ever seen. <laughs> I hope he's watching today. Ken, if you're watching today, I really love you, man. Hey, this is a tough guy. He is not mean at all. He's a tough guy. But I will tell you, he decided when they started to have a vote in Maine on whether they were going to allow same-sex marriage, he said, not in this state. He said, I'm going to rally everything I've got. I'll, I'll, I will rally every resource that we can put into this, but we're not going to stand for this in the state of Maine. And he called Tony Perkins. He said, Tony, get whatever you can get and bring it up here and let's go to war over this thing. We are not going to let this happen in Maine. Now this is after all the other states in the Northeast are, are approving these same-sex marriage votes. And doggone Tony Perkins came up there. He got with Ken Graves and they started working this issue. They mobilized their resources. They massed and they defeated this measure. Absolutely. <laughs> Here's the thing. You got to not worry about who gets the credit. And that's a problem in the church today. When you're talking about massing your resources, you got to be willing to work with another ministry over here. You got to be willing to work with somebody else over here and not worry about who's going to get the credit for it. And say, we are all working for God's kingdom. This is not about you. It's not about your ministry. It's about the kingdom of God. That's one of the problems in the church today. We got too many preachers that are more concerned about the church than they are the kingdom. They're building brick and mortar churches, but they're not focused on the kingdom. And that's part of our problem today. We've got to mass our forces and be willing to go do what has to be done within the ministry today to build the kingdom of God. Mass is an important, important principle of war. The next principle of war is maneuver. Maneuver. Maneuver means maintaining the agility to move our forces rapidly to take advantage of an opportunity or to exploit an enemy weakness. Maneuver. Remember at the Battle of Gettysburg over in central Pennsylvania. And that's a wonderful place. I love to go over there and just walk that battleground and I've done it many, many times. But at the Battle of Gettysburg, a guy named Grosvenor Warren, who was actually an engineer officer for the Union Army, decided to go down and check the left flank of the Union forces on Seminary Ridge there. And when he got down there, he realized that the Confederate forces were, were gathering in a, in a small valley down below, and in a very short period of time, were going to come right up the flank of the Union Army, and probably, probably defeat the Union Army up there. He sent a runner. He said, go find anybody you can and get them up here. Get them up here and tell them to stop the Confederates from coming up our flank. And as they ran down the line and ran into a, a brigade there, they, they were able to very quickly pull the 20th Maine, commanded by Joshua Chamberlain, who, by the way, was a man of God, who, by the way, was a theologian. He and the 20th Maine at a double time ran down to the left flank of the Union Army and did the notorious pinwheel movement until they moved right into the, the path of the oncoming Alabama Regiment that was trying to come up and, 
and outflanked the Union Army. And they stopped them dead in their tracks. A great loss, but they maneuvered very quick. That wasn't part of the plan. It wasn't something they anticipated doing. But when the call came, and when the necessity arose, they had the agility to move very rapidly and get somebody in place there, and it probably saved the Union at Gettysburg that day. It is very important that within our ministries, within our personal lives, that we maintain the agility to understand what's happening so that we can take advantage of opportunities and exploit weaknesses of our enemy. We've got to be ready all the time. That means there can be no periods of laxity. It means you've got to be ready all the time. You've got to be prayed up. You've got to be studied up. You've got to understand the Bible. You can't take a vacation from this whole concept of studying the Bible and praying and seeking God and maintaining your relationship with God. Because when that opportunity comes, you're going to miss it unless you're listening to the voice of God, unless you're reading His Word every day and you're letting Him speak to you through His Word and through your meditations. You're going to miss the opportunity to maneuver unless you stay in close harmony with God and what He wants in your life and His expectations. Be ready all the time. And that, by the way, that means you have to stay abreast of current events. And let me say this, I, I did this the other night at a place, I said, ha, I said, how many of you ladies watch Oprah? And I thought nobody in this audience watches Oprah. A dog on this, sitting right next to me, this little lady says, I do. I said, well, let me lay my hands on you and pray for you, man. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if you get your news from Oprah, I can promise you, you are not going to know what's going on in the world. Look, you have got to stay focused on what's happening. Amen. The enemy manifests in physical form. He manifests through people. He manifests within uh, organizations. And you've got to know what the enemy is doing. You've got to watch it. You've got to stay abreast of current events. I think it was Billy Graham that said we ought to walk around with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other one. It is important. You can't just read the Bible. That's important. But you've also got to stay abreast of what's happening in the world and understand how your enemy is manifesting so that you know when it is time to mass, when it is time to maneuver, when it is time to do the things that God is calling you to do. The next principle of war is called unity of command. Unity of command. Dwight David Eisenhower had a real challenge in World War II. He had two very strong-willed commanders in the European theater. One of them was Bernard Montgomery, the Brit, and the other one was George Patton. And both of them had their own ideas of how to fight this war. Patton wanted to go straight to Berlin, go for the juggler. Let's go in there and just tear down Hitler's stronghold and then they will have no choice but to stop fighting. Montgomery wanted to fight incrementally up through each city. Let's take Paris, let's take Rome, then let's take Vienna, and ultimately we'll wind up in Berlin. And the two of them wanted to fight a different way. And Eisenhower had to step in and say, pardon me gentlemen, but let me remind you that I am the supreme allied commander. You work for me, and I will dictate how we are going to fight this war. And that's exactly what he did. It's called unity of command. Who's our commander in a spiritual sense? We all know it's God. It's Jesus Christ Himself. Our commander is God, and we need to keep remembering that. But here's what is absolutely critical. If we're all working for the same commander, then why can't we work together? Why is it that the Baptists won't work with the Pentecostals, that the Presbyterians won't work with the Catholics? I mean, why is that? At one point, well, at some point in the future, God's going to forgive a lot of bad theology. He really is. I'm absolutely convinced of it. He's going to forgive us for a lot of bad theology, a lot of bad man-made rules. See, I'm not associated with any denomination anymore because every one of them has different rules, and I can't remember the rules, so I just gave up on it. <laughs> right? Because what, yeah. What the Bible says is work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Right, Pastor Joe? That's what I like about Calvary chapels. You know what? When you come to Christ, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior in a Calvary chapel, they don't teach you the rules. They teach you about how to build your relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, but we in the church are divided because of the rules. 
and the differences in doctrine. Look, it comes back to one fundamental thing. Do you believe that you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ? Not by your works, but are you saved by confessing your sins and accepting that Jesus Christ has already washed them away at Calvary? That's the most fundamental thing. All the rest of that stuff, I think God will forgive. I think He'll get over it. So we, as we apply the rule of unity of command, we've got to work together. The Baptists and the Presbyterians have got to be willing to work together. The Pentecostals and the Catholics have got to be willing to work together. And it comes down to a matter of unity in the church. God wants unity, but we're divided and that prevents us from being able to do battle the way that we need to be doing battle today and accomplishing what God's called us to do in His kingdom. It's not about you. It's not about your ministry. It's about the kingdom of God. And that's the thing that we have to keep reminding ourselves of. It's about the kingdom. Christ is the commander. Get beyond your differences and focus on the kingdom. The next principle of war is security. Security. I'm so glad that the previous speaker talked about the watchman because the reality is the Bible tells us that we are to be watchmen. We're to never never be quiet. We're to never tire. We are to be watchmen 24 hours a day watching and providing security. Security, if you think about it, the frigates, the Navy frigates were really designed and created to provide security. They were fast. They were agile. They could get out and get around the fleet and let the fleet commander know if they were going to be attacked from a particular direction. That's what frigates were designed for. The cavalry you know, uh, Jeb Stewart and the cavalry. You know, by the way, you know where Jeb Stewart was at Gettysburg? This is no kidding. This is a piece of historical trivia, but he was buying shoes in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Because his troops were out, their shoes and boots had worn out, and he was buying shoes in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Having said that, that's what the cavalry does. The cavalry rides on the flanks and out front and to the rear, providing security, watching to make sure you're not surprised and attacked. Security is a very important principle of war, and the whole concept of each of us being a watchman is very important. Now, who, what are you watching? Well, first of all, let me say this. I've seen more attacks against spiritual leaders now than I have ever seen in my entire life. Now, the Viet Cong, during the Vietnam conflict, learned very quickly, when they put a sniper in a tree, they said, look, when this platoon or this company comes down this trail through the jungle, find the commander. Take him out, and that'll cause chaos. When we were studying Russian doctrine so that we could defeat the Russians, you know what we were doing? We were learning to identify the tank or the armored personnel carrier that had the commander in it, because we knew if we knocked him out, they were gonna, it was going to be chaos. So who's the enemy after today? The enemy is after the pastors, after the spiritual leaders in your ministry. Because if they can take them out, it's going to create chaos. It's going to knock you to your knees. And I'm seeing pastors struggling and, and fighting their own battles today like I never have before, all over the country. And some of them are falling, and you've seen them. So what am I saying? Under the concept of security, I'm saying protect that pastor, protect that spiritual leader. You have a responsibility. One of the reasons that so many pastors get off on these tangents and fall is because there's nobody around them that will hold them accountable. In my ministry, I've got three retired military people, and not one of them is afraid to tell me you're acting like a fool. <laughs> and what you're doing is not right. No, you can't do that. But I expect them to hold me accountable. But you've got to get, come around those spiritual leaders as part of this concept of warfare and providing security for them. You've got to come around them, and you've got to be watching them. Look, let me tell you. In a little town I live in in Virginia, the pastor just built a new office, and he put a window in that office. I said, well, well, that's pretty good. Is that so you can talk to your secretary? He said, no. That's so when a woman comes in here so I can counsel her, my secretary is watching everything that goes on. You've got to protect those spiritual leaders. You've got to come around them and be the watchman for them, because if they fall, and they're subject to do that, because guess what? Just because they're preachers does not mean that they don't have exactly the same problems that you do. They do. Indeed, they do. You've got to come around them and protect the spiritual leaders. That's part of the whole concept of warfare. Okay? We're all watchmen. The next 
principle is economy of force, and that means simply using the smallest element of your ministry against a secondary target. You remember we put special operations in Afghanistan right after 9-11. It was going to take months to get enough force in Uzbekistan to get conventional forces in there, and we couldn't wait. So we put special forces in there, and little 12 men, special forces teams, and they organized, trained, and equipped the Northern Alliance. And before December, before we could ever get the conventional troops in there, they already had taken the whole country back. By December of 2001, we had Afghanistan, and the conventional forces were still building up. That was an economy of force measure. There are times when you simply need to understand that there's a secondary target over here, there's a secondary issue over here, but you don't move. It's not like kids running to a soccer ball. You know, you ever, you ever watch the little kids, you know, running, playing soccer? I remember my five-year-old. Somebody kicked the ball and the whole team, <laughs> both teams, <clears throat> went to that ball. Don't do that. Don't do that. A secondary effort, an economy of force measure. Stay focused on the first principle of war, and that's objective. What's the objective? This is a minor nuisance and annoyance. Put what you have to there, but don't overdo it so that you can stay focused on the objective of your ministry. The next one is surprise. And if you think about uh, Christmas night, 1776, George Washington crossed the Delaware River, and he surprised those Hessians right up here in Trenton, New Jersey. He crossed the Delaware River. They'd gone, the Brits had gone back to New York for the winter. And George Washington crossed the icy Delaware and attacked those Hessians and defeated them and literally at that moment turned the tide of the war. He surprised them. Let me tell you, there are times I really believe when you don't need to announce what you're planning to do. You don't need to go on television and say, I'm going to be handing out gospel tracts in the Muslim neighborhoods today. <laughs> what are they going to do? They're going to come back and they're going to prepare a defense against you. You don't need to do that. You need to maintain. In fact, I believe, this is my theological belief, that Satan cannot read your mind. And there are times when you need to pray silently before God. You need to sit and meditate and pray silently before God and not announce what you are planning to do. Don't lay your plans out for others to see because all you're doing is giving the enemy an opportunity to counter what you're planning to do. There needs to be a certain degree of security associated with that. And then the final principle of war is called simplicity. And that simply means make plans and concepts that everyone can understand. In the military, we have a thing called the commander's intent. And what that means is, what does the commander intend for this operation? What's the objective? And state it in terms that everybody understands it. So when that first burst from a, a machine gun comes out across your head and chaos results, everybody knows what they're supposed to do because they understand the commander's intent. And within our ministries, we need to say, have the same thing. You see, one of my frustrations is we've developed our own language in the church. We have a language that is hard to understand. And when someone comes into the kingdom, someone gets saved, someone accepts Jesus Christ, and we start speaking this church language to them, they have no clue what we're saying. And you want to integrate them into the ministry so you can minister to them, so you can mentor them. They don't even speak the language. But we as Christians, we as mature Christians have this tendency to confuse them. Simplicity is a principle of war, and we need to stay focused on it. I'm closing with this, with two, two things that I want to say to you. You've got to get in this battle. We are in a tough battle for the very heart and soul of this country and for the whole world. If America falls, the rest of the world's got no chance whatsoever. Israel, Israel, as I, far as I am concerned, is tied to America, and we're tied to Israel, and we have a responsibility. At the Battle of the Bulge at Bastogne, the tanks were rolling out of Bastogne because the Germans had literally surrounded. The tanks were rolling out of Bastogne, rolling down the highway, and here comes this one soldier. He's wearing the patch of the 82nd Airborne Division coming up the road going towards Bastogne. And this tank pulls up beside him, stops and says, hey, where are you going? The guy said, I'm going to Bastogne. He said, where are you going? And the tank driver said, well, I'm getting out of here. The Germans have surrounded the place. That guy from the 82nd said, get in behind me. 
said, this is as far as they're going. I'm the 82nd Airborne Division. You know what? Every one of us as Christians, we ought to be saying, get in behind me. In April, I stood at Arlington Cemetery at the common grave of those eight men. And there were people there that had been hostages, and there were people there that had been part of the rescue force, and we gathered there for the 30th anniversary to honor our fallen comrades. And as the national anthem played, and I stood by that common grave of those eight men, I said, what did they die for? What did they die for? And you know what? They died for something they believed in. Something that was more precious than life itself. They died for 53 Americans that were depending on them. They died for a nation that was depending on them. And they were all volunteers. Nobody had to go. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to decide what price we're willing to pay for our faith. What price are we willing to pay for this country and for the nation of Israel? What price are we willing to pay for the God that we serve? Every one of us needs to make that decision. Well, thanks for listening to this episode and learning that despite the enemy's warfare, the enemy has no power compared to the God we serve. Well, if you found this podcast really valuable, please get in touch with us. Let us know who you are. Do you want to talk about something else on this show? Do you have a question you want Joel to answer? Send any comments you may have to podcast at joshuafund.net. Your feedback is incredibly valuable to us as we develop this podcast. And as always, you can check out our show notes for anything you heard on the podcast that you'd like more information on. For Joel Rosenberg and the Joshua Fund Ministry team, I'm Carl Muller. Thanks for listening to Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg. I'm Joel Rosenberg. On your left, you'll find some videos we've chosen specifically for you. We look forward to partnering with you to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus.